the experience of Cisco, which is a very large company, participating in open source. And we've had a lot of different kinds of conversations here this time, other times, about sort of that experience. So I'm not wanting to get so much into the nitty gritty of the, the sort of traditional blocking in, tackling, learning to engage with the community stuff. Because we have a number of panelists who've actually participated widely in communities in moving forward the world in open source. What I'd really love to do is to get some questions from you guys about the kinds of things you don't see in panels like this. The kinds of questions you have about the work they're actually doing in the community rather than the what is it like to be in a big company coming up. So to begin, what I'd like to do is offer our panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves and a little bit of what their experience has been and the kinds of communities they've worked in and the kinds of things they've worked on. And you're free to proceed in whatever order, but I'm going to bet on, on moving that way. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, Damian Hansen, I'm a software engineer with Cisco, and uh, I currently work on the Kubernetes project. Uh, I've been involved in containers for uh, about three years. Uh, I am leading a team of engineers uh, that is adding IPv6 support to Kubernetes. Uh, if you are in this room a couple hours ago uh, for Thomas Graff's presentation on uh, Kubernetes and IPv6. Uh, Thomas and I work very closely together in the community. So uh, it's been a really exciting project in the sense that uh, you know, it's not a Cisco-only uh, project. It's, uh, or, uh, it's a Cisco-only Cisco effort. Uh, it's representation from a lot of different affiliates uh, that have been able to add this support to Kubernetes. So it's a real uh, open source success story. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Charles Eckel. I'm a, a software engineer by, uh, I guess, education and training, and uh, been doing that for the majority of my, my career. Um, working with open source a lot, um, starting in like 1999, when I think open source really first, at least in my mind, that's when it kind of first came into the masses. Um, and done a lot of work with standards as well. Uh, throughout the years. Um, the area where I've been working is mostly around uh, communication software, initially more like traditional telephony systems and voice over IP and video conferencing. And uh, that's what brought me to into Cisco. And now I work in DevNet, that's our developer network, and I have the role of representing to the external development community what Cisco's doing in open source and in standards, helping you understand where we're contributing to open source and to standards how they manifest themselves in our products and solutions, and um, how you can work with us and how we can help you uh, to build on top of the products and solutions that we provide using the APIs that are there. And uh, when the code's open source, I think that makes it even easier for us to work together. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarfil Bayraktar, and um, I'm a principal engineer at Cisco in Chief Technology and Architecture Office. Um, I've been working in the networking industry since early 1990s, before the internet was commercial. Um, my expert, mostly as a network engineer, my expertise is in IP routing protocols. Um, I've been with Cisco for six years, and in the last three years, I have been, uh, my team and I are running an open source project called Streaming Network Analytics System, or SNAS, SNAS.io. Um, what we do, we, we tackle the problem that was not really solved in the last 20 years in networking uh, to get a very special kind of data from the network, m m meaning BGP data, which is stateful and different than the other ones in real time. Um, and it's been very interesting and rewarding to work uh, with the open source community. Uh, in May, our project moved under the Linux Foundation family. Uh, it's been also interesting for me to go through that process. Um, I'm also the uh, founder of Women in Technology at Cisco, where every month the technical women at Cisco get together to talk about what's going on in our industry. Thanks. I don't think this is working. Is it working? <laughs> I'm off the hook. <laughs> Uh, hi there, I'm Ann McCormick. I'm a tech lead at Cisco, software engineer. Um, I've been working at Cisco for 
maybe too long, some might say, 11 years. I've been working with OpenStack for the last three years and attended, um, I think, five different OpenStack summits. What I work on particularly is MetaCloud, which is an on-prem managed cloud solution that Cisco offers. So we go to the customer site, install the hardware, get the infrastructure working, install OpenStack on top of it, and then continue to maintain it as a service going forward. And particularly what I focus on is networking in OpenStack. Thank you so much. So start thinking about the kinds of questions that you would be interested in having answered by our, our panelists. So to sort of prime the pump and, and get a little bit more information out of them. Um, I, I wanted to open up with a question. Um, it, to express it, but why? <laughs> You're up. <laughs> who wants to go first? <clears throat> okay, we'll, we'll rotate as to who has to go first. So, okay, why? Um, I'm going to take that as why am I involved in? See if this works. Oh, okay. I'm going to take that as well, why am I involved in, in open source and kind of why am I passionate about it? And I think for me, things got started. I mentioned uh, back in 1999, I, I, uh, I went to go work for a startup company. Um, we were in, uh, we called ourselves uh, Vovita. And Vovita came from the name Voice, Video, and Data. We were uh, going after making um, software for, uh, uh, for communication, voice over IP stacks. And, um, Linux was kind of the thing at the time, so we thought we'd build everything on Linux. Open source was seeming really cool, so we thought we'd open source everything we did. Um, our protocol stacks, our soft switch, as we called it, everything was out there in the open. Um, I didn't have any idea how we were going to make money or be sustainable, um, but, but, but it was fun. It, we, were, we were doing great things, and people were excited about what we were doing. And I remember um, people would heckle us about our name, like Vovita, and they you know, like, is that Velvita? And they call us the cheese company. And uh, we kind of took that to heart, and we decided, well, well, we'll name our releases after cheeses. So our first release came out. It was kind of rough. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, some would say it, it stank. Um, we, we, so we called it Stilton. We thought that was a very fitting name for our first release. Um, fortunately, things got better and better, and eventually we came out with a release that we thought was, you know, getting to be a little more sophisticated. We called it Bree, and um, and then I remember going home afterwards. It was happened to be my sister's birthday, and her name was Brienne, but we always called her Bree. And to me, it this may seem stupid, but it was kind of special that the name of our release it, it was it was in all the files, it was in the software. Um, and then I could go and I could show her what I was working on at work. I'd never shown my family like the code I wrote. Here I thought it was special because I could show her, hey, here's this release that's named after you. She's my, my kid's sister, so she was really young, and she was kind of touched that I could show her this, and, and then we could actually like build it and run it and use it to make a call and make our home phone ring. You know, so kind of stupid stuff, but it, to me it was cool. I'd never shared anything like that with my family, with my sister. And it kind of dawned on me how cool this open source software was, the fact that it made what I did that tangible and to share with my family, with my friends, with the rest of the community. And um, loved it ever since. Excellent. So who's up next? I can go next. <laughs> so I guess there are different reasons why you would go open source when I look at some of the reasons why people did open source in the past is that you're dealing with a very pressing issue that involves multiple entities, maybe a whole industry, you want to go fast, you want to be agile, you want to apply it to a lot of places. And the problem space that I was dealing with uh, involved uh, legacy and new networks uh, across industries and all types and sizes of networks. Uh, so we really wanted to look at the problem holistically without the restrictions of any of the vendor-specific uh, targets, like one product in mind. It, it was too narrow for us. So we wanted to uh, collaborate and be very transparent with the community of the uh, system that we were building. We wanted to get that feedback fast and honestly. So um, uh, through the open source, uh, you know, you kind of bypass all the 
regular process channels and you go directly to the members and the users and it's been really, really uh, rewarding. Um, originally, we were a standalone open source project just on the side, but in May, we did move under Linux Foundation and the reason for that move is that once you have something that solves the original problem and you have a framework, it doesn't end there, it actually begins. So we wanted to be part of the ecosystem of projects who could really benefit from what we built. We wanted to you know, provide that service to them. And we also wanted to understand what else was going on in the industry, you know, whether what we built is really um, enough future looking. So it's been a very uh, productive and useful approach. So um, monetization, I think, comes after when you're dealing with a really big problem. Um, and so far, it's been a really good journey. Thank you. So I'm going to take that with my um, OpenStack glasses on and say, why is Cisco doing OpenStack? I've been hearing, you know, the terms waves of the internet. The first wave was when we were building the infrastructure. And of course, Cisco was deeply entrenched in, in building that and the protocols, defining that being in the standards bodies, IETF. The second wave is cloud. So now we're not so concerned about the infrastructure. It's there, it's great, it's working. Now we want to build on top of it. We want to look at things from an application point of view. So the innovations really are happening at that level now. And why particularly OpenStack is because it's a leading open source cloud infrastructure. So I think it makes sense for Cisco to participate in that. And that's it for me. I'll take the why and say uh, why IPv6 uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, I was uh, presented a unique opportunity uh, to uh, kind of have an, a blank canvas uh, about eight or nine months ago. Um, and so we were going, our group was going through a transition and uh, you know, our management team came to me and said, okay, we want to start getting involved in uh, open source container projects, uh, can you help lead a team and then figure out where and how and, and why? And so, you know, this why question is I, I asked myself uh, why quite a bit during this process. And, and so as I looked through the container landscape, uh, again, I had a background of a couple of years in containers uh, before uh, this came about. And, um, and, and so I honed in on Kubernetes and uh, for multiple reasons. I saw it as kind of rising to the top as that um, you know, container clustering system, right? How do I run containers at scale across multiple hosts uh, in my data center or across multiple data centers? Uh, you know, it was going from uh, Docker to, uh, to Kubernetes because Docker solved that problem of how do I take an application and make it easier to deploy, manage, maintain on a single host. But as everyone started drinking the Docker Kool-Aid, that's really when the conversation started turning to, to Kubernetes. And so I, I honed in on, on Kubernetes and I, you know, I, I asked myself why um, across three primary spectrums is, okay, if we're gonna contribute to Kubernetes, you know, why do we contribute to Kubernetes? Why do we use IPv6? And uh, I said to myself, well, IPv6 was important to the Kubernetes community. So I checked that box. Uh, and I said, okay, well, IPv6 is important to Cisco. We're a networking company. We have a rich tradition in, in IPv6. Uh, so, to me, I was able to check that box of, of why IPv6 for Cisco. And then I think most importantly is customer. Like, if you're not solving a customer problem, you're not trying to help a customer, then why are, why are you doing this? You know, it could be great for the community, it could be great for Cisco, but ultimately, if you're not helping a customer out, then why are you doing this? And, uh, you know, we were fortunate to actually have multiple Lighthouse customers um, that wanted this functionality. They wanted IPv6. Their big IPv6 shop across their data centers. They're moving uh, forward with Kubernetes, and they're saying, to, you know, they're saying to us, they're saying to the community, where is IPv6 in Kubernetes? And so um, you know, that's what essentially brought us to uh, contributing IPv6 to Kubernetes. And um, this is an effort that started at the beginning of this year. 
Um, and it, it's really uh, great to see uh, the team and I going from sitting on the sidelines uh, to actually being highly involved in the SIG network community. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, it's such a big project, so much going on. They break the project up into SIG, special interest groups. And uh, again, we went from not being involved at all in the SIG network uh, group to being highly involved and in IPv6 being uh, probably the number one feature that's gonna be coming out in the 1.9 release. And uh, again, it's not a Cisco only kind of thing, which to me is, is uh, you know, one of the, the big drivers of open source, right? It's, this isn't something that Cisco is doing. We may be highly involved in it, but uh, again, there's affiliations, uh, Google, Mirantis, uh, um, Andre who is up here, I mean, the list goes on of, of uh, contributors in the community, both in Kubernetes, CNI, which is a, another project that's uh, very important to Kubernetes networking, um, Sky DNS for uh, Kubi DNS. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just been really a, a great ride over the last uh, eight or nine months going from what do we do here to actually, you know, starting to paint that canvas with the picture and now we're just putting kind of the finishing touches on that picture. Thank you all. So for those of you who've seen me speak in other situations, you are aware of the fact that I'm not particularly good at boundaries. And this is also true of panels. Um, and so I have a very expansive notion of panel. Yes. Yes. Sure. We don't need no thinking mic. I presume you can all hear me even without a mic, correct? Awesome. Great. Are you recording? Is that why you need recording? Yes. Oh. All right. So for the audience at home. <laughs> so I have a very expansive view of panels. Um, everyone likes to think of panels as a collection of, of people up on stage. And we have a very distinguished collection of people up on stage. I tend to think of panels as including the audience as well. And so the question I really want to po pose to you guys in the audience is, why are you here? Why did you show up here? What are the things that you're really interested in coming to understand from being here? So please, speak up, raise your hands, let me know. Yes? I think about that Malik Erickson. Hello? <laughs> Money's good. That, that's a really good question. Um, really quickly, does anyone on the panel want to respond to that and sort of describe their experience inside Cisco? Because we've got many different viewpoints here. I guess I could just say, sometimes I think of open source like tree huggers. It's a utopia. You know, everything, <laughs> we all love each other and get along. And But the reality is we need to make money, right? I mean, we all work for companies that need to make money. So I, I think it's a a very big concern. How do you monetize that? How do you, how do you come to panels and summits like this and um, not appear as just a vendor trying to sell hardware? It's, it's a very difficult balance. I like to think we're doing it well, but. Sure. Uh, so uh, I've been involved in open source within Cisco uh, for five or six years, and I remember uh, the first year or so. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, you know, the company at that time uh, just didn't get open source. And so a lot of my time was spent actually just internal discussions, internal meetings of explaining why open source and, and that it's not a threat to you, right? Um, so from me speaking personally, uh, how to do open source to me is it's not rocket science. You know, 
what I like to do in life generally is if I go to do something and it's new to me, I always try to kind of look around and figure out, has someone done this before? You know, and so when you look at open source, there may be a lot of different open source contributors out there and companies that contribute. But uh, for me personally, I look at the likes of uh, Red Hat, the likes of CoreOS, companies that uh, have built a successful business model around open source software. And I think if you, if you spend that time to look at, well, how does Red Hat do this? How, do they, how are they so successful in these open source projects, but still a very profitable company, and you spend that time to, um, to see how they do it, you can almost use that as kind of your recipe for Ericsson or whatever company that you work for. Um, so. I think um, you know, when I look at open source, um, Cisco's been um, involved with open source for a long time, but most of the focus on internal, say, policies and, and that type of thing was around compliance. Really, it was about um, you know, licensing things correctly, uh, attributing as you're supposed to to meet the licenses that you're using, not using licenses and software packages that you shouldn't use in certain ways to kind of more of a um, protect yourself type of mentality. But that's what's been pretty strong at Cisco for a long time. Um, it was only kind of more recently that I think you know, Cisco engineers had been contributing to open source, but it was on sort of a, and still is to a large extent, it's very disaggregated. Um, Cisco, for those of you who are not as familiar with, with Cisco corporate, it's, um, to me, I think one of the things I really like about it is how disaggregated the company is. It's, it's, it's actually, you'll, you'll see people in Cisco have no idea what other people are doing, and sometimes they're doing sort of conflicting or duplicative things. We'll find out about it at conferences like this. Um, <laughs> that's one reason to do open source. I've seen that happen to you too. <laughs> and it's, um, from an employee point of view, it's very empowering, because you can go off and do things. Um, and I think so far with open source contribution, it's worked out quite well at Cisco because the employees have had the best interest and been educated and more or less contributed to open source well. Uh, however, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. We don't have any sort of like central open source office. Uh, maybe we should, but we, we love that disaggregatedness too. So I don't know if there's a trade off there. Um, so I think we have room for improvement, but you know, as long as people are doing the right thing in the open source community, it seems to be working so far. That's, that's how I would describe it. Um, so to answer your question, how does open source work at Cisco, I think the answer depends on your group, first of all. Yeah, I was just interested in the sense of work you're doing, you know, premium and open aspects, you know, because I, I can assume that that would be pretty close to Cisco's uh, business. Of course, you know, Kubernetes open stack as well, it is, but they are more technical uh, open source projects. You know, yes. Not So it really depends on where you think the real mon monetization come from. Um, so we're tackling the infrastructure problem, the collection of stateful data that's in the hundreds of millions of objects. If you think about routing, uh, the number of prefixes you collect, and if you want to do it in real time, which people do all kinds of um, workarounds, like dumps and other ways. Um, I, you know, we, so I'm in this, what I wanted to say about the groups is that I'm in the chief technology and architecture office, which is not necessarily a product group. And um, our job is to really see where we should invest, what the framework work should look like. And the monetization really is going to come from the applications that are built on top of it. Cisco, just like any other company, will have to write the right type of applications and services and monetize it in the long run. I, I think, I see open source as a long-term investment in a way for the company. Just like when the internet was first starting, uh, Cisco was very much involved with the IETF, leading the technology. They didn't have to, but they were. They had an interest in it, 
uh, lots of people spend lots of time there. It was a very loosely coupled standards organization. It still is. That's why it's request for comments and not like some big ITU standard. The reason why Cisco contributed, they wanted to have the um, uh, technical lead and they wanted to be the experts and they, want, and they maintained that expertise within the company and they knew exactly what products to build on top of what was uh, discussed and developed. Open source is in a way the same way. Um, Cisco alone cannot build this big infrastructure because it's a multi-vendor problem. It has to be sold as a multi-vendor uh, solution. And it is an industry-changing uh, project, in my opinion. It's very small and it's not very well known yet. But the fact is that uh, people gave up on the problem that we're trying to solve, which is the collection and uh, presentation of a very high volume of data in real time to the applications. Applications and services are where the real interesting stuff is going to be. We do have some IP, by the way, that we pro uh, protect through regular methods. That doesn't stop us from filing for patents, but you know, making the code uh, available uh, to other uh, users and get the feedback, I think, puts us in the right track for the eventual real application landscape. Excellent. So we know why Manoush is here. Why are you here? Yes, you. You did raise your hand, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I was wondering what, uh, what are the future projects or items would uh, Cisco be involved with with our open source? I just found out about Canadian. I remember that they were like a Cisco FedEx one thousand years ago for the VMware. And Canadian is like kind of another uh, virtual machine thing. So I'm just So really quickly for the home audience, the question was what other kinds of future projects do you think that Cisco will be involved in going forward? What other kinds of things do you have your eye on on the horizon? I guess um, anything to do with networking, we have our <laughs> eyes on. <laughs> and the other thing that I see across the company is the analytics and apps. Everybody has their eyes on that. Uh, I don't know if it's been resolved and I, I'm not aware of uh, project names to tell you, but I see a lot of movement towards uh, data analytics and applications and especially in the networking area where we have the expertise. Anyone else? Well, maybe this isn't really so much an open source project, but a way of working with open source. Um, I think it was, uh, you mentioned before the, the standards and work that I, uh, Cisco's done, say, in IETF. And um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of work with standards, with open source, and Cisco's been very supportive and of me in doing that, um, trying to bring those two things together, combining open source and standards. And I think part of the thing there is there's a lot of networking technology that's backed by standards. Now, there's a lot of work being done in open source. We really want to make sure open source works well with those standards. Um, IPv6 support in Kubernetes is a good example. Take some of the stuff that came out of the IETF for networking, make sure it works well with, with open source. I think you're going to see more and more of that. So it's not kind of like, you know, here's the, the old way of doing things or whatever that was more standards based and now it's just, it's all open source and standards aren't needed. I think uh, it's in Cisco's best interest that those two worlds come together and we'll continue to see more work bringing those two worlds together. We had a really quick question here uh, before we continue with this. Yeah, that's a good plan. So I wanted to actually elaborate, I want you to elaborate on that. I'm, I, had, I, had, I confess I'm a standards guy. I'm, I, work for, <laughs> I work in the telco industry. So for oh. telco and communications, um, as we go to the software-dominated future, what kind of things are best to do in open source and what kind of things are best to do in standards? And like, w as a company, where do you plan to put energy into open source versus into establishing standards? Thank you. So um, I, I would say, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, what, what I'm pushing for is um, not so much an either or, but that, that both. It's not, oh, do I take this to standards? Oh, do I take this to open source? Um, I would say work on it within the standards, but then don't just work on it in the standards for three years and think the open source community is going to wait for you to three years later come out and say, here's the standard, now go implement it. No, you start working on it in the standards, be in parallel doing open source reference implementations or an open source project implementation of it, have the two feed off of each other. So at the end of the day, um, you not only have the standard, but you have an open source implementation of it that people can start to use, extend, whatever, you know, bring in to, to meet their needs. So yeah, I, that's the way I look at it. I guess one thing I can add is that um, we want to see the standards making faster decisions, adopting newer technologies, and Cisco <laughs> has a lot of interest. Alcior <laughs> actually does hackathons at IETFs. That's a new, uh, so we're trying to really um, bring the standards bodies up to you know, today's standards in terms of agility and technology. There is still a lot of uh, um, influence the standards bodies uh, have, and uh, there's a lot of use for that. Um, I don't think we're ready to well, abandon that. That's a good question. <laughs> I can tell you which one is more um, sexier, <laughs> and you can guess. Well, I can just go back to Charles' point of uh, it's not one or the other, it's doing both, right? Is that the standardization process is, is long, uh, and um, you know, I go back and look at Cisco's history is okay, let's work in the standards, but let's develop this needed functionality, and then when the standard is, is ratified, we will add that, and, you know, VLAN tagging with ISL, and then with 802.1Q is standardized. Every, you know, we added support in, uh, for .1Q, and it eventually became the default instead of ISL for VLAN uh, tagging. Um, how that relates to open source, it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Is this functionality that, um, you know, is being standardized, but is also implemented. Well, is that implemented in an open source project that we're leveraging for, uh, for our products? Okay, if so, then let's go ahead and, and implement that standard in that open source project and then consume that into, uh, into our product. If it's uh, vice versa and, and it's, uh, you know, functionality that's in our own uh, software, uh, it's still the same approach. It just comes down to where do we actually um, then implement that standard, open or closed. But if, if like all industry parties are participating in the open source, do you really need standard? Because you know, by, by actually working in the open source, they're doing something, you actually treat it a de facto standard anyway. So I, I guess you guys are being politically correct. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's a gray area. A good example is uh, CNI, the Container Network Interface. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a standard. It's an open source project that's trying to standardize on how containers interact with the, you know, with networking, um, you know, in a containerized environment. Uh, you know, Docker has lib network, right? And so Docker, if you've got Docker, Docker Swarm, you use lib network. If you've got Kubernetes, Mesos, and I mean, CNI is really starting to be adopted, but neither of them are standards. Uh, um, you know, do one of those eventually float up and be a standard? You know, I don't know, I'm not involved in the standards committee, but um, you know, I think, again, just going back, looking at history of, okay, we've, we've got to implement this functionality somewhere, uh, preferably in open source software instead of closed source software. And let's make sure, let's work with the standards committees uh, and try to bring about a standard that everyone can follow. Um, you know, so. so I think the other thing is that it depends on the area, right? There is no point in 
for me to have an open source project for BGP. BGP is handled at IETF. It's very well handled. All the stakeholders are there. That's the place to do. Now, uh, our, my project is routing streaming network analytics. Um, and I, we actually work very closely with IETF because we use BGP monitoring protocol. So that's not even really part of our open source engagement. But at IETF, there was really no um, forum or area to build this framework for us. So it seemed like the code piece, really, we had to take it out of the standards. Uh, otherwise, we could never um, make progress. It depends. Can you build the community faster than the, you know, the standards groups to mobilize? I, I think it depends. Um, I'm very bad at time, but I'm very into interactive audiences. So. In, the, in the NFV space, right, and in this kind of the beginning, although I guess NFV started like maybe five years ago, um, there's been standards started and it was going slow, and now there's open source, multiple open source communities, right, and it's kind of a competition. And open source is different, you can leverage it into your product and all that stuff, but if I look at it just from an interoperability and openness point of view, some people say, well, as things get more software, why write a spec on an API when you can just have code and then you know it works, right? So if in terms of interoperability, is there certain kind of things that are best to just do in open source for interoperability, or is it better to do it in standards? Like protocols, obviously, you do in standards. Yeah, I was going to say, for protocols, there's no it, point. It, it, yeah, I think looking at protocols is actually a, a good example. If you look at, like, like networking, Right. I mean, look at we have uh, we have OBS, we have OpenSwitch, we have VPP, um, we have proprietary implementations. Many, many of them. Fortunately, they can actually interoperate and coexist because there's those underlying standards. So there's an example of, you know, perhaps one day there'll be one open source switching platform. Ed hopes it's VPP <laughs> that, that just you know rules everything, and then the standards don't really matter because the whole world runs on VPP. But, you know, maybe that's not what's going to happen. And maybe there's going to continue to be a mix. So even with open source implementations, it's still fantastic having that standards basis behind them. You know, one forward to rule them all and in the darkness find them. Yes, I'm going to give you a mic. Thank you. Thanks. So just curious about your uh, company's uh, open source strategy. So let's say you have an internal project, you found it interesting and you consider to open source it. So what's the consideration before you open source it? Let's say the FIDO work very, very nice. Before you open source it, what kind of the, what make you, made you made the decision to open source it? What are the considerations? So normally I prefer to have the panel answer, and you will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> implied threat intended. Um, but, I, I will actually address this one a little more directly because I was very intimately involved in the open sourcing of VPP and FIDO. Um, a conversation that I have repeatedly with executives inside Cisco is bringing back the fine point that we're in the business from a Cisco perspective of creating value. And we have a historical tendency to think about clutching intellectual property as the only way to create value. And the truth of the matter is that it is often the case that you create more of business value in your company by letting go of certain things. So you, you can look at the landscape and say, okay, there are market transitions that are happening where customers are demanding that things are based on open platforms, based on open source software. They're not saying that they won't pay you for things. They're saying that they don't want to be locked in. You have places where the innovation that is necessary to make it through the complex transitions that we're dealing with more and more quickly, like the transitions to cloud native and microservices, can't be done by any one single vendor. We have to have a place that we can collaborate together on them. And, and so you build a case around the value creation of letting go. Now, then there's a whole lot of mechanics around things like making really certain that you are completely beyond reproach in terms of the providence of the code that you release. Um, I can't tell you how many annoying code scans that I've read through just to make sure the endless array of false positives were in, false, in, for, were in fact false. 
So there's a lot of mechanics to it as well, but the fundamental thing that has to be worked out is what is the business value case that you make your, to your executives? And how do you help them make that transition into the new world of thinking about things? And now, back to the implied threat to the panel. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. It, it goes back to uh, the way I came into Cisco. I mentioned getting started in open source at, at Bovida, and we were open sourcing everything. And, and Cisco acquired us. And after they acquired us, now they had to decide what to do with this code. And Cisco wanted to have a voice over IP solution. And, um, but they decided, you know what? These guys are already open sourcing stuff. We're going to continue to open source it. Because yes, while we want to develop a voice over IP and hopefully a video IP um, solution, we, we want that whole industry to grow. So we want to put all this stuff out as like a toolkit to help others create voice over IP uh, solutions. Because if, there's, if the industry moves from traditional telephony to over IP, that's good for Cisco. We sell more routers and switches, we'll make money on that. If we also sell the best voice over IP solution, great. If someone else does, great. So let's put it out there as open source. So that was a decision way back then on that open source project. And just another way you can look at it. What is it, where are you deriving value um, from? And that can influence your decision. Uh, just really quick, one thing I wanted to add there is there's also a benefit to open sourcing things, which is you can, Assuming that you can build a developer community around the technology, you can actually accelerate development and innovation. All right, so um, we love you people up front, but we haven't heard from the people in the back. So why are you in here, there in the back? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> That's a good answer. My experience is on the other side. You want to say something? No. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Anyone else in the back? Why are you here? I know some of you. I can guess. Don't make me guess. <laughs> Come on. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm very close to calling names. <laughs> so do volunteer. Yes. <laughs> so I'm here because I'm curious to hear uh, some of your stories. I know we don't have much time. Uh, but what, what is the, the hardest experience you've gone through trying to convince people about open source within the company and why it's so important? So the question is, what was the hardest thing about going open source? Um, to uh, explain the value, why we're doing it, why we want to do it, and this uh, more future-looking aspect of the uh, open sourcing, what it will bring to the company. Because, you know, it's a traditional company. It, uh, Everybody is used to building a product and selling it, and you're done, and you collect the money. But now we live in a very different world of, you know, subscriptions and memberships and um, services. And we're going through that transition just like any other big company. And um, we had to convince that this was the right way for us to proceed. And we had to have conversations about how we we're going to bring back money and value to the company through open source, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of tension in the company, and I think it's a very healthy tension. It has to happen. Uh, I think another thing that's challenging is to have people just you know, kind of bite off that chunk of work of open sourcing, and not just open sourcing, but open sourcing, say, correctly, right? It's, um, because the last thing we want to have people do is just throw open source out there and then be like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we don't care about that. I remember someone saying like, okay, well, we were working on this and now we decided we're gonna, you know, cut that project on our team, but we're gonna open source it and hope that the community takes it over. <laughs> and it's like, no. Because that always happens. <laughs> the, the only way we're gonna open source this is if you agree you're actually gonna put more people on it so we can help develop a community around it. So I think getting people to 
to think about that and understand the value, the real value of open source, and so that they're good open source community members and they open source you know, correctly, I think is just one of the biggest challenges. Because oftentimes, once you start talking about that, then you end up you know, scaring them away. Or, you know, so I think that's, that's one of the tough balances. Also, we don't have the cleanest, uh, it's probably a huge understatement, we don't have the cleanest uh, open source contribution process, really. It's not the most streamlined. <laughs> and that easy to navigate. So a lot of people just don't want to fight off that complication of you know, having to do the right thing, check with other business units to make sure that they're not, you know, you're not killing their business model or whatever. Um, do the right due diligence. That's, to get people to open source correctly is uh, still can be a challenge. Okay, so we, we have just been told by our lovely minders that we have hit our time. So I want to thank our distinguished panelists uh, for their contributions to the conversation. It's been excellent. I I'd like to thank you as the audience for participating as part of the panel. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for indulging my impish desire to see if I could run an entire panel on a single word. <laughs>